So now we're going to cover dementia at a baseline level, mostly for diagnostic purposes for your shelf. I hope this can help you really just avoid spending a lot of time reviewing this uh, before your neuro clerkship. So an overview is to help us just separate these, at least initially here. In Alzheimer's patients, the key here is going to be progressive memory loss, and the symptoms usually start with memory and eventually going to include more severe neuroclinical findings, neuropsychiatric findings like language issues or other uh, apraxias, and we'll go over that in a minute, vascular dementia, which is due to multiple strokes that may be obvious in the vignette or somebody who's had subclinical strokes for a long time, and their uh, condition usually worsens in a stepwise progression rather than a progressive linear level. And usually, memory loss is not the first symptom described in a patient with vascular dementia. Then somebody with Lewy body dementia, there's a lot of hallmarks that I can give you that will hopefully remove any confusion about this diagnosis. Hallucinations, REM sleep behavior disorder, which we'll go over, and Parkinson's symptoms, obviously. And frontotemporal dementia, this is actually the only place I'm going to mention this because it usually is pretty obvious if you're aware that it exists, which is just loss of inhibition. They drool. You know, These are people who used to be mild-mannered who are going around flirting with the opposite sex and making inappropriate gestures that they wouldn't normally make. Those are going to be the hallmark findings in that dementia. So let's just knock out how do we uh, recognize Alzheimer's on the test. And usually it's going to be in older people unless there's an inherited condition, which I don't expect you'll see. And um, again, symptoms are going to start with memory. And at first, there'll be mild things that are kind of benign like, like this. But uh, later on, you'll start to see that they describe things like getting lost in their home, which is visual spatial impairment, or they have issues with the umbrella term executive dysfunction, which could mean they don't have insight into their condition, they're not aware that they have memory issues, they lose their ability to multitask or manage a checkbook, or to live at home alone, you know, they're unkept, uh, things like that. Uh, then. Later on in the disease, you start seeing aggressive symptoms. They're agitated more often. They think people are out to get them, and they lose their ability to speak, and, and, and language deficits develop. Some definitions for you. I can't even say that word, anosognosia, whatever. But that is a term that describes their inability to recognize their memory deficits. And apraxia is when you forget motor tasks that you used to know how to do, like tying your shoe. Be aware that somebody who has Alzheimer's could also get acute delirium and somebody who maybe is earlier on in their disease course who's hospitalized and they describe to you that they're combative or agitated and don't know where they are and are acting kind of nutty, that's somebody who may have an acute delirium superimposed on Alzheimer's disease. And also be aware that you can treat these people with the cholinesterase inhibitors, uh, donapazil or rivastigmine. Just remember those drugs, and that may be an answer to a test question if you have an obvious case. Then Alzheimer's uh, can be confused with late-life depression or pseudodementia, and I think it's important to characterize the differences so that we don't get confused. And memory loss that the patient is aware of and is concerned about. That, if you just remember from what we just talked about, somebody with Alzheimer's usually does not recognize that they have memory issues. And there usually is a hint in the history, like they have had a recent death, or they're newly living alone, or they've been ill for a long time. And then further exam, you know, they don't have additional neurologic issues, like inability to name things, or loss of motor functioning. Uh, so there's a lack of the additional neurologic symptoms that are required to diagnose Alzheimer's. And these people may demonstrate to you that look of depression, where they're just kind of sunken over in their chair, and Typically, they answer, I don't know, when you ask them questions in comparison with an Alzheimer's patient who's going to start just blibber-blabbering and trying to answer you even if they don't know the answer. An Alzheimer's patient uh, is great at giving you a lot of history when you're interviewing them that is incorrect, unlike these patients. Uh, so vascular dementia. Key here is that it's a stepwise decline. And the first symptom, like I said earlier, is usually not memory. And this could be due to multiple strokes that are either 
obvious cortical strokes that have massive uh, hemiparesis or aphasia. They could have hemineglect syndrome, or it could be more subtle things like subcortical strokes with subtle motor findings and subtle deficits in their neurocognitive function. Um, but you should just be aware that the the range of presentation is just just vast. But the key here is that if you have a patient with dementia who is who their initial symptoms were things like apraxia or hemineglect or motor symptoms, and then they went on later to have memory issues. Uh, that to me would suggest more of a vascular picture. And additionally, that stepwise decline is usually pretty easy to recognize if you're looking for it in the question stem. And you should see that abrupt new deficit onset or new, almost like they're, they're, they're kind of doing better. You, th you think their dementia is getting better and then bang, they have another decline or they have new neurologic symptoms that are added on to what they already had. And an MRI may show you hypodense lesions from multiple previous strokes. And remember that in Alzheimer's disease, you could have atrophy of the medial temporal lobe, and that would be the key for that disease. I forgot to mention that. So this is a case that I wanted to just throw out here at you because I wanted to see how it might look in the question is that you got somebody who maybe sounds like they're getting Parkinson's disease because they're kind of stiff, having trouble walking, and their wife tells you in the vignette that they wake up at night and they act out their dreams. They get up and start punching things and talking to people in their sleep. And, and they're not just sleepwalking, they're vividly acting out their dreams. And that's called REM sleep behavior disorder. And it's a clinical marker because these people who have REM sleep behavior disorder are very likely to develop Lewy body dementia later on in life. So Lewy body dementia, some of the hallmarks here, and I think it's a really interesting disease and it's usually very easy to isolate and diagnose in a question if you're given the symptoms. They usually have daily fluctuations that almost seem like delirium, but they occur for months. Like they'll, they'll wake up and for most of the day they'll be pretty good. And then as the sun starts to go down, they'll start to get a little bit more delirious or agitated and these people characteristically have hallucinations and for whatever reason they usually see gnomes, gnomes or little people like children hallucinations in their home and they're not they're not uh, you know, they're not like scary hallucinations they're just sort of these they'll sort of tell it to you in a laissez-faire fashion like oh yeah I've been seeing little people in my home they're there they've been there for months and they they say if you didn't know that they had blue body dementia, you might think that they were just telling you about their grandkids. And then again, the REM sleep behavior disorder, the, this marker, the REM sleep disorder, was on my medicine shelf, my psych shelf, and my neuro shelf. I don't know why they think it's so important for us to know this, but at some point you're going to need to learn it, and I, I think you could learn it now, and you could recognize it and get questions right on your medicine shelf and subsequent shelves. And then also they can develop Parkinson's disease symptoms which isn't surprising. And lastly, we'll just cover delirium. I think most of you can recognize it. It's that hospitalized patients, when they get acutely confused, and you're all going to see it on the medicine service, so I don't really have to uh, you know, define it for you, but know that you may be asked to recommend ordering a urinalysis or a chest x-ray to find a source of infection or even a blood culture. And if the patient is on a lot of medicines, you may recommend reviewing their medications as an answer choice. And first-line treatment, if they're not agitated uh, and they're not a risk for harm to themselves, is just to make the environment more like home, open up the, you know, the, the blinds and bring pictures from home. And if they're agitated and the intercom person is calling for Bert, then you would want to give them haloperidol. And you may think that that's an, an, a pretty large step to do, but remember that Benzodiazepines actually can worsen this condition, and it happens a lot in the hospital, but Seroquel actually is not advisable, at least from a mechanism of action standpoint, to give these patients. So haloperidol is the best answer to give to an acutely agitated delirium patient.